Chapter 1, Is There Anybody Out There? And I begin the chapter with a quotation from George Bernard Shaw. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends upon the unreasonable man. We human beings are virtually unique in the animal kingdom through our ability to individually and collectively shape the environment in which we live. We have an inbuilt desire to challenge the physical constraints of our universe and become masters of our own destiny. And we are born into a world which has its own highly evolved ecology and seasons that both sustain humans and all other living beings, and yet we still strive for more. We gain comfort from the natural rhythm and laws of nature, whose awesome complexity helps us believe in a powerful deity beyond our comprehension, yet the vast majority of us are not willing to accept the boundaries and limitations that nature has provided. Blind faith in our existence and acceptance of the hand of fate are not enough for many of us as we strive for better understanding and control over the forces which shape our future. The advances that mankind has made in the span of my lifetime to bring control of these forces into the hands of individual citizens are truly unprecedented in our history. So this chapter charts the start of that journey. BC, before computers. It seems incredible to me now that as a baby boomer, born four years after the end of the Second World War, in 1949, I came into a world where my family home had no access to any of the communication technologies that have been such an important part of my life and are so taken for granted by today's younger digital native generation. Our family home had no telephone, no car, no television, no high fidelity entertainment system and definitely no computer. The street lighting was still powered by gas in some parts of my town. We had no bathroom, no central heating and our only means of transport were bicycles or public transport. Foreign travel for the ordinary man in the and street was unheard of and yet we lived less than one mile from the centre of a prosperous market town. I was born in the Lincolnshire town of Boston to a father who was a carpenter and joiner and a grandfather who was a gang foreman on the railways. My very early years were spent living with my parents and grandparents in the family home in Boston before my mum and dad eventually got a council house of their own in the village of Wibberton just south of Boston and within easy sight of the main railway line from Grimsby to London King's Cross. It's a railway line that no longer exists. It's now a road, the A16. So when I was a child, every morning at ten past eight, I would hear the whistle of the King's Cross Grimsby Cleethorpes Express as it left Boston, and I would run to the landing window to catch sight of a magnificent Britannia-class steam locomotive as it came into view from behind the stacks of telegraph poles in the timber yard that stood at the bottom of our garden. Billowing smoke and with the exhaust chattering, these engines would haul maroon carriages filled with unknown people bound for unknown and unseen destination that so excited my imagination. Regular Britannia-class locos used on this route were Robin Hood and Oliver Cromwell, and they became almost like friends to me over my early years, and as I became older, they would carry me to Peterborough and London. It was my grandfather, Sidney Plant Langford, otherwise known as Pop, who helped 
foster my love of steam engines and travel. Railway men in those days had concessions which allowed them to free travel for the family across the whole railway network. My grandparents would take me from a very early age all over the country at weekends, mostly to cities where Pop and I would watch a football match while Grandma did some shopping. In my bedroom at home, my dad had made me a wooden toy box which contained one of my most prized possessions, an engineering drawing of the rail network designed for the wood yard at the end of our garden. I used to study it and imagine that one day I might be a railway engineer. Amongst my earliest memories of a very small child was being given a present of a toy train and, and how I sobbed because it wasn't the right colour. Once we'd moved to Wibberton, close to the railway line, I would spend many hours by the crossing gate on Titton Lane East, watching the gates closed manually by Mrs Skinner, the resident crossing gate keeper, who lived in the house next to the level crossing. I would crouch down and listen to the hum of the rails as the unseen distant trains would begin to come into view with freight hauled by clanking old WD, wall department engines, expresses fronted by Britannia-class locos or more local passenger trains pulled by B1 Pacific engines like Mayflower, whose nameplate now resides in a Boston museum near to where the Pilgrim Fathers were in prison before making their historic journey to the New World.